so you've been on a, on a whirlwind tour of representations of time um, using constraint reasoning. And I'm going to close up this tutorial with um, just a sample of some applications of the techniques that uh, Brent and, and Roman went through. Um, since we're in a planning conference, I'm going to emphasize a lot um, applications related to planning, scheduling, and execution. Um, but I'm going to, at the end, sort of entice you by, try to entice you by suggesting that there's applications beyond planning for uh, these, these reasoning systems as well. So, um, and because I work for NASA, I'm going to be biased in terms of my examples in the area of space applications. So forgive me for, for that bias, but um, anyway. Um, OK, so let's start with, um, I, I want to classify, first of all, the applications of these uh, temporal reasoning systems into two kinds of applications. One, and they and they're, and they're sort of go, in a sense, they go in opposite directions between abstract representations and concrete representations. So in planning, scheduling, and execution, we're going from some abstract representation of a problem to something more concrete, and we're using time in the process. So planning, in planning, you have an abstract goal or a set of goals that you want to accomplish, and you transform that abstract, those abstract goals into a sequence of actions that you can perform. So you're going from a more abstract representation to a more concrete representation. Um, and then time is introduced in the process of, of this transformation, transforming goals into sequences of actions. Then there's sort of the, the opposite direction. You may have a bunch of data that is time stamped or not, and you want to ab abstract from that data certain temporal relationships or important patterns of, of, <coughs> of temporal relationships from the data. So that's that. So in that case, we're going in the opposite direction. We're going from a, from a concrete representation, a bunch of time stamped data, into something more abstract, like an Allen relation or a, a collection of constraints. So in processing data, and data processing, time is introduced in the process of abstracting use of useful information from um, unstructured or structured uh, data. And I'll give an example of that. It turns out that a lot of these uh, representations and of time are very useful in medical information systems. Abstracting uh, information about a patient, for example, from just knowing um, certain, certain, that if certain events have happened. So I'll try to, um, at the end, I'll try to um, introduce some examples there. So let's start with, um, with um, planning uh, applications. So I'm going to introduce a, 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 class of, a class of planners that are roughly called constraint-based planners. And two examples of constraint-based planners, one of those developed at uh, Ames, Ames Research Center, where I work, called MapGen, which was used to, plan, to plan science observations for the MER rovers um, from around 2003, 2004. And the other, and the other kind, an example of, that kind of, of this kind of planner is the Aspen system that Steve Chen talked about yesterday, and, um, and uh, which has been applied recently to the Rosetta uh, European Space Agency mission. Um, those are two examples of, and there are other examples of constraint-based planners. Um, and they all incorporate temporal reasoning in, in them, and I'll, and I'll kind of briefly illustrate how. So a constraint-based planner is a family of approaches based on temporal networks, timelines which describe fluence, which describe uh, propositions that change or states that change over time, and states and activity ne uh, as networks of variables. Um, they also involve constraint propagation, which we've been, which we were introduced to here, and something a little bit different, which uh, characterizes planning systems. Planning is a constraint satisfaction problem, but it's a dynamic constraint satisfaction problem. And if you know what the, what the dynamic constraint <coughs> satisfaction problem is, um, that's a, those are problems where the constraint problem changes over time. So you introduce variables or constraints or domains that are added and deleted dynamically as you're planning, as you're, as you're solving this problem. So that's a dynamic constraint satisfaction problem. And planning is, a, is an example, constraint-based planning is an example of a dynamic CSP. 
Um, so um, uh, <clears throat> the constraint reasoning that's done for planning, and a lot of you may be already familiar with this since you're at a planning conference, um, but uh, the representation of uh, representation consists of activity parameters and temporal events, constraints among parameters and events, um, the kind of reasoning going on with planning, um, identifying when a plan candidate is, is inconsistent, and, and temporal inconsistency is one example of, of an inconsistent plan. And also, um, uh, the reason, reasoning for planning involves eliminating choices that don't lead to valid plans. So you're, you're adding and deleting activities or moving the activities around in order to find a valid plan, a consistent plan. Um, some of the requirements for, for planning, um, uh, constraint-based planning, uh, there are general um, there are general requirements. Um, there, there's, uh, the constraints are not just temporal; they're arbitrary kinds of constraints, and they're de depending on the domain that you're that you're of, of application. Again, it's a dynamic. It requires the network to be dynamic. Constraints and variables and values are added or deleted, and um, it, there's an efficiency requirement. It's a large problem, and, and, the, and the and the reasoning has to be has to be um, efficient. The network has to um, that network is in continuous change and, and can be, must be queried at every plan step. So there's, a, there's obvious trade-offs, in, in, as in every hard problem, there are trade-offs between efficiency and the completeness of the reasoning that you're doing. So here's a, here are some com components of constraint-based planning. So activities are represented as intervals. So there's an activity in a space application, take a picture. Um, each interval specifies an activity. The, the little blue, uh, blue squares represent the start and end points of the interval. And intervals can have parameters. So you can take a, so in that example, you can take a picture with three different kinds of instruments, science instruments. And then a candidate plan is a network of intervals. Intervals are linked by temporal constraints. So you can see, if you look really closely, that looks exactly like an STP, which it, or some variant of some temporal network that uh, we've been talking about here. Um, interval parameters are linked by constraints, and um, so you have a constraint network. Um, uh, if a, in, in, feasibility of a candidate plan if, uh, can be tested by determining if um, the network is consistent. So here, um, here are the, uh, more components of a constraint-based plan. So a plan is a network of intervals representing activities. So here's a space example, um, a, par a partial. Um, this is actually a, a kind of a abstraction from some of the um, planning that was done on the remote agent experiment in the 1990s, where where a spacecraft was was uh, planned and executed um, executed its plans for um, science activities as a technology demonstration of of automated planning. So here we have an engine. Um, the, the spacecraft engine, the spacecraft camera, and a, um, a state variable called attitude, which describes what the spacecraft is doing at, at a particular time. So um, each of these components, so, th so this, is, this is what a plan looks like. So the engine is described as thrusting to a certain direction called D12, followed by off. The camera is um, described as a, a state, a, a, evol a, a sequence of states. It was off, then it was made ready, and then it was in the process of taking a picture, and so on. So um, each of those um, elements is. Um, so let's let's go through a, you know, some of these components. So you can see that an interval um, compo is composed of an activity that has a predicate assigned to it. So thrusting, off, ready, take, pick, point at, turn to are all predicates describing actions and states. Um, the predicate parameters, um, each predicate type has a fixed set of parameters, and um, each parameter instance comes from an associated domain. So thrusting um, is a predicate and uh, with a parameter called d dir, uh, a variable called dir, which has a domain consisting of different directions that it can be pointing, or mm -hmm. I'm sorry, uh, it can be thrusting towards. And um, you can see the parameters. You can see there are uh, parameters that are shared between different predicates. So this parameter, these two parameters, must have are constrained to have the same value, which is not a temporal constraint, but it's a it's a different kind of planning constraint, and so on. Um, uh, intervals are 
describing activities with durations. We already know what intervals are. Um, so, uh, and they have start and end times associated with them, as you know. So, um, the, yeah, so um, that's another component. And then we have temporal constraints of the sorts that we've been just describing. Um, dis uh, constraints either between endpoints or between intervals. I believe, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, that, um, that, that um, you can, in, a plan, in, in the plan for MapGen, specify either uh, constraints on endpoints or Allen constraints on intervals. So it's a, it's a mixture of the quantitative and qualitative um, approaches that, that Roman described. Um, it's, a hybrid, it's a hybrid of um, temporal constraints. And then there are things called timelines. Timelines describe an, evo an evolution of a, a component subsystem of the complex system that you're planning for. So a timeline associated with a camera is, describes the evolution of the states of the camera. And the timeline associated with the en engine similarly describes the evolution of the states. And the, one of those constraints on the plan is that every point on the timeline has to have some action associated with it. So one of the things that a plan has to be is complete in the sense that every point on, the, on every timeline has to have some kind of activity associated with it. And that's part of the planning process. Okay, um, so that's kind of a, a brief description. I, I, what I haven't gone into is, is our algorithms for planning. Um, uh, those, that's a little bit beyond the scope of this, um, of this uh, workshop. But it, you, can, you can, a lot of the planning um, techniques that um, are applied here are incremental planners in the sense that, um, and you can, again, you can see that there's a, this is a dynamic constraint satisfaction problem where you're incrementally adding um, you have a set of goals that you want to. You have a set of goals that you want to accomplish. For example, taking a picture might be a science goal that you want to accomplish, and then you have constraints, and then and then you you build a plan from those out of those goals by um, by assigning um, uh, activities that collectively satisfy that goal. So I, again, I'm, I'm a little bit beyond the scope of this. This is not a workshop on planning, but but you can kind of see how time and temporal reasoning and temporal representations contribute to, to constraint-based planning. So one of the things that you discover when you really deploy planning systems is that fully automated planning is usually not possible. You usually have humans that need to be, need to, need to be um, engaged in the planning process, um, especially in space applications. You have, you have operators and, and um, science teams and engineering teams and uh, and again, Steve talked about this yesterday in the context of the Rosetta mission. Um, humans, humans uh, fully automated planning is usually not possible in, in complex applications. Humans need to be allowed to schedule and unschedule activities and edit plans, moving activities in time. Um, and the automated, primarily the automated planner maintains the validity of the plan. It's used usually in the process of verifying, uh, a lot of times it's used in the process of validating choices that humans make rather than automating the process of planning, validating or verifying the choices that humans make. Um, the human in the, 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 there are advantages of human being in the loop, which helps, which helps in the understanding and the accepting of plan. The reason I mention these things is because there are certain issues that arise when you have flexible representations of time, like we've been talking about. The graphical representations of time are flexible. Um, uh, and the underlying representation of time in simple temporal networks or any of these other networks is, is a flexible. You have a range of times that you're allowed to use. But um, interfaces for planning that humans look at usually show timelines, which timelines are not flexible. They, they, they specify starts and ends, specific starts and ends of times. Um, so the question is, how is that instantiation, how do you go from this sort of flexible representation of time to the timeline, to, the, to, the, to what the human sees, which are un unflexible. And those are, that was an issue that actually arose on the, on the MapGen, um, the MER missions, on a, lo a lot of times. So um, how, how is that particular instantiation selected for the human to see? So you could say, well, you could always choose the earliest start time. You could always choose to display the schedule that has the earliest start time, 
But that's not always intuitive to, to humans. Why did you choose that particular instantiation of the flexible plant? Um, and then there's another issue. Um, given a, a new goal, how should the planner update? There, there are different ways in which a planner could update uh, a plan given a new goal. And, uh, and what humans tend to prefer is are, are plans that minimally perturb the existing plan. So, so um, you add a goal, there, there are different ways of adding the goal to the plan based on how much of the rest of the plan that you, that you change. Humans tend to prefer you know, m making the minimum amount of changes to the existing plan rather than going through and completely generating a new plan. So these are just some of the, some of the temporal issues that are beyond sort of the simple, the simple um, well, not necessarily simple, but go going beyond just consistency of the plan, um, uh, issues, issues involving the human interaction with the plan that are really interesting, I think, um, applications of, of some of the work that we've been doing here. And there's a, a lot of a work in so-called mixed initiative planning that has a lot of, um, where, where the human is in the loop of the planning process, where a lot of these issues sort of ri rise up. Okay, um, now I'm going to turn to, uh, to um, temporal reasoning and execution systems. So autonomous systems with a, um, with a deliberative or a planning component com oftentimes combine planning with execution. So you're not just building a plan, you're actually executing the plan that you're building. So let's look at some of the temporal reason issues and temporal reasoning that arise when the, when the, when the plan is being executed autonomously by a, a rover or some autonomous agent. So the, the subsystem responsible for carrying out a plan is sometimes called the executive. Um, and when dispatching plans with flexible temporal constraints, there is a need for a, a, for a, a sub-module a sub of the executive that's called a dispatcher. The dispatcher is the one that, that basically maintains the, when you're dealing with flexible constraints, maintains the consistency of the plan. So the dispatcher notifies the executive when an action can or must be executed. And we can define conditions of, of um, t t uh, uh, conditions of that sh requirements that you want for the dispatcher, namely correctness, whenever the ex whatever the executive does adheres to the temporal constraints, and the preserving of flexibility of the plan. So the dispatcher never tells an executive that an action can't be performed at a certain time when it actually can. So that's the, con that's the requirement of um, flexibility preservation, I guess you could call. So just to get your intuitions going, um, so let's, let's suppose that this temporal plan has been uploaded to the, to the rover, and the rover, the rover is executing the plan, and the plan involves the sort of navigation through, um, through, a, through obstacles and, and for, um, in order to take observations of, of, um, of interest. To, uh, for science. Um, <clears throat> so let's look at some of the issues that, that arise from, from this sort of scenario, um, executing the execution of flexible plans, okay? Now, um, there's really two things, two ways of going about this. There's, there's really two ways um, to describe, two, there's basically two options that you have when you're, when you're deploying flexible uh, plans. One is um, scheduling offline, and the other is scheduling online, <clears throat> okay? Um, now, the blue boxes are, are, uh, represent stages in the development of the plan that we've already covered in the tutorial, namely describing the temporal plan, which is just identifying the set of constraints that are involved, and testing for consistency. We all know how to do that now. Um, but if we want to transform the plan into a, something that's executable, then there's a number of additional issues or additional stages that have to be, have to be um, uh, performed. On the left side, when we're scheduling offline, there has to be a separate scheduling, um, uh, scheduling step. Um, and then on the, on the online um, side, there are, uh, there's, a sort of, there's a stage that can be called the reformulation stage, and I'll, and I'll talk about that later. But let's just go through, and then on the, on the online side, there are, um, uh, there's the execution algorithm itself. So let's look at some of these. Okay, um, scheduling offline. So what is scheduling? So what, it, what, what does it mean to schedule a, a, 
temporal plan? Well, it means actually taking each variable and assigning a specific time to it, okay? Now, what are the, what's a good way to do that? Well, one way of doing that, so given a, let's, let's take the case of a simple temporal network. Given a simple temporal network, a schedule is an assignment of times to all activities. Uh, one way to generate a schedule for, from a uh, simple temporal network without search is to transform the simple temporal network into something called a decomposable STN. And, and that just means um, a, a decomposable STN is one where all the implied constraints are revealed. And, that, and those can be, um, as Roman talked about earlier, um, the, all of the implied constraints are revealed by applying the all-pair shortest path algorithm to the initial, initial um, graph, initial constraint network. And then you can incrementally assign times to the variables in any order and then propagate. So that's, that's what it means to schedule a... Um, so if you, for example, you, know, you can choose... Here you can choose x0 to be 0, then propagate forward um, to, the, to, the, um, to the adjacent uh, nodes, and then you could, let's say, assign t uh, to ls to assign to 15, and then propagate, and so on. And, um, and it, again, it doesn't matter. The or once, once the all-pair shortest path uh, algorithm has been applied to the original network, it doesn't matter the order in which you can, you can generate a feasible schedule from. Assuming that the initial graph was feasible, then you can generate a scheme, feasible plan. So that's, kind of, that's what it means to schedule a, um, a flexible plan. Now, let's say we do that offline and then give that plan to the rover, which is actually a schedule now. It's all, it's, all the times are fixed. So what's the problem with that? Does anybody see a problem? See, does anybody see a problem with this solution? Yeah. It's hard to ex oh. it's hard to execute at exactly that time, and there might be disturbances that push it. That, that's right. It destroys the flexibility. The flexibility of the initial plan is destroyed if you give the rover time. So it's it's um, that's exactly the problem. So you may have unexpected changes in the task duration, which can cause plan failure if the scheduling occurs offline. Um, the fixed schedule, as by definition, removes flexibility. So that may be a problem. OK, well, what's the solution? Let's, instead of the solution involves, instead of scheduling offline, let's, schedule on, let's basically amount to scheduling online, OK? Um, through a process we'll call dynamic scheduling. So assigning time to event, at ex you assign the time to event execution time and, um, and guarantee that all the constraints will be satisfied. Can anybody see a problem or a challenge? Let's say, what is the challenge of dynamic uh, scheduling? Um, so, the, the, so dynamic scheduling uh, has an advantage of preserving flexibility, but what's the disadvantage? Or is there a disadvantage? Is there a, is there a, is there a, is there a disadvantage to uh, dynamic scheduling? Uh, the decisions need to be made on board. Yes. Yeah. And what's, what's the problem there? <laughs> it scares the operations people. Yeah. Well, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Computation, computation time. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's, it slows. It, so, so that's, that's the challenge. The challenge is to, um, if, you, if, you're, if you're migrating reasoning from offline to online, you're, you're migrating reasoning on board, but you have a system that you need to preserve and to keep safe, and you don't want it to be propagating temporal constraints while it's falling off a cliff or something like that. Okay, so there's the challenge. So, um, so we call that we call that execution late latency. Basically, um, if you're thinking while you're if you're thinking while you're um, executing, then the thinking might the thinking takes time and therefore might cause bad things to happen to the plan. So we call that execution latency. So um, the 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 solution is so you, so the solution is to generate a schedule with low latency through the removal of redundant edges. So <clears throat> what that means, that's a, that's a different transformation of, um, it's a different transformation of, uh, of a simple temper plan than the ones that we've been talking about uh, up till now. So here are two, if you look closely, here are two 
uh, simple temporal networks that actually have the exact same execution performance. It's the exact same, the exact same behavior of, of these networks happen. So in other, in other words, um, whatever, whatever I do to this network, however, however the rover executes this network, it'll have the same effect as if it executed this network. And if you look closer, you can see that. For example, this network has a constraint between A and D. That's always satisfied, no matter what, how you execute this network, this constraint will always be satisfied, right? So whatever, whatever, ch whatever choice you make between this interval and that interval and that interval will satisfy that constraint. But you can see there's an advantage of the right one with, with respect to propagation. There's less propagation going on, right? When, you, when you're executing the, the, minimum, the smaller network, there's less execution going on. I mean, there's less propagation going on and therefore less execution latency. Okay, so um, there are algorithms out there that, um, that have been developed and uh, I'll, I'll give you some references, but um, there are sim fairly straightforward algorithms for removing redundant edges of a, of a simple temporal network um, through, uh, which, which, are, which generate um, temporal, net, uh, which are called reformulations um, of the plans, and in order to, in order for the purpose of minimizing latency during execution. Does everybody see that? Anybody have any questions about that? So, the left and the right ones are equal in terms of their execution, but um, there's less propagation on the right. Okay. Um, so then, dynamic execution. The dynamic execution algorithm itself is a simple is a simple uh, um, process, fairly simple process of choosing a, uh, an event to execute and then propagating the effects. So um, the, the algorithm is, is roughly speaking, you know, you execute an event when, it's in, when it has two conditions that are true, enabled and active. So it, a, 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 an action is enabled when the predecessors of the event have been scheduled and, the, and a, an event is active when the current time is within the bounds of the event, okay? So the algorithm just says when an event is enabled and active, assign time and a propagate effects to immediate successors. That's the execution, or the, that's the dispatching algorithm or the execution algorithm of temporal plan. And you can see it's, it has to be simple. It can't be really complicated. And it is, with a, and it is a, um, a simple algorithm. And um, these kinds of, um, uh, these kinds of issues have, have rose as, as a result of, of the remote agent experiment and other experiments where, where temporal plans were actually executed by real systems. Okay. So here are some references to um, dispatching, to the issues of dispatching that I just referred to, dispatching STPs, uh, dispatching um, disjunctive temporal plans, and um, more recent work and a slightly different approach to um, temp to um, with Brian Brian and his students um, uh, using a different kind of represent a different kind of programming language called uh, a reactive model based programming language using temporal plan networks which we saw um, I think um, Roman talked a little briefly about those which have branches and conditional networks okay um, now, if, in order to let's see, I don't, how much time I got? I don't have too much time left, but I'll just close with a brief discussion of applications in an entirely different direction, um, namely processing temporal uh, information in medicine. So the techniques that um, uh, so the, there's different kinds of um, temporal information processing that goes on in medicine. One is temporal database management, storing, processing, and retrieving time-oriented information. Temporal abstraction, which relates to the task of uh, creating interval-based concepts from timestamp data, temporal data visualization, and uh, medical natural language processing. So taking, taking um, text from um, that uh, physicians and, and nurses have generated and, and, and processing them into temporal networks. Um, I just want to point out that the interval algebra has been applied to the tasks of temporal abstraction and query processing to determine uh, temporal relationships between medical events and temporal constraint networks, um, the, the um, quantitative approaches have been used to facilitate patient monitoring and problem detection 
managing medical resources and determining the consistencies of temporal constraints and clinical guidelines. Um, also used to model temporal information in clinical discharge summaries. So a lot of the, a lot of the applications in, in medicine for these networks have to do with, with um, monitoring patient, um, monitoring, monitoring the, uh, the, the process of a patient recovery or a patient um, administrating a, a, a medical procedure. Um, and also making sure that cl clinical guidelines have been adhered to by a, pro by a process that, that um, doctors have been following. So this is just a simple example of, of temporal abstraction. Um, so you can see it's going from the direction of, 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 of uh, concrete data to more um, abstracted representations. So these might represent sort of hemoglobin counts at different times. These are different measurements. Um, uh, you may classify this event as being uh, consisting of low hemoglobin. And then, and then there are processes of, of, of abstracting these events into intervals. So you, make, you might do some interpolation, for example. You might interpolate from, these, from the fact that these, this whole range of, of tests resulted in low hemoglobin, that the patient had low, hebo, low hemoglobin for the duration of that interval. So you abstract from data into intervals. And then you may do other kinds of intervals. Uh, this is a very simple example, but you may do other kinds of, of, of interval uh, merging or joining of intervals to have a, to have a, um, a uh, to other sort of intervals or other kinds of temporal relationships. So that, that's just a simple example of, of, um, of, uh, of temporal abstraction, going from the direction of data to, to uh, neural representations. And here's some of the more of the references uh, of some of these applications that I've talking uh, that have been talked about in this section. Um, and, uh, and these slides will be available. We forgot to write these down, but these slides will be available to anybody who wants them, and um, we can provide that information to you. Um, and thanks. And a shameless, shameless self-promotion. <laughs> the three of us have re recently published a book on Morgan and Claypool publishers that is completely based on these lectures that we gave today on this tutorial, and we're planning to retire on the royalties of this book, <laughs> so we hope you'll all buy it. But, <laughs> but anyway, thanks very much. Are the slides included in the book? No. <laughs> but we, we, we want to, we're, we're yeah, planning we're, to post them. Yeah, we're really? thinking of posting yeah. them on the website of the book. Ah. So we have to, we're uh, talking to it, uh, about it with the publisher. Right. But they will be available on my website and Roman's website. Okay, ah, okay. so probably starting tomorrow. I'm proud. Right, time promise it will be tomorrow, uh, but it will be next few days. Next yeah. few days. It was a wonderful deck of slides, very simplistically and elegantly presented. So, yeah. Thanks very much. Thank, Thank you. Much. Thank you. All right, if there are any other questions, if you want to talk to any of us either now or, or um, I think we're probably out of time, but we'll be around this, this week. But some of us will. I have a question to you. I'm very interested in how NASA are automating their space systems. So, so do you all. Basically, do you use updating some temporal network to the, your space systems, or are there any specific difference between automating Mars rover or automating us observing satellite? Yeah, there, there are different kinds of problems. Uh, there's a lot of different kinds of issues um, related to whether you're going to do where you're going to do the um, execution or. Whether, whether the plan that you're generating is going to be executed autonomously or whether or not. Um, Earth, observing, Earth, Earth observing systems um, require, it's a different kind of planning problem. Um, it re could require coordination and, and coordination between different satellites. Um, but again, there's, there's issues about, and we kind of alluded to them, about where, how much of the decision making and the temporal, how much of the temporal decision making do you do on the ground uh -huh. versus on a ground-based system, helping operations, and how much do you do on board? Yeah, yeah.
So those are those are. Yes, because it's us observing satellite go very fast. So I don't think we have enough time to compute the planning. On board. On board. Yeah. Yeah. You'll, typically, that's right. Um, there may be some. There may be some reactive. I mean, that's an issue we haven't talked about. There may be some reactive planning that's done on board. Uh -huh. um, for example, you, you. But this is not necessarily temporal planning, but. Um, Resource planning, planning, managing the storage of data, for example, or the downlinking of data, uh -huh. that could be done on board. Some of it, it might be. Awesome. Right, but you're right. Um, satellites, uh, so the planning for satellites are usually done days in advance. <coughs> Offline. Great. Okay. Looks good. Thanks. Again, we'll be around, so feel free to catch us anytime.